Hello, I'm Jay Nordlinger with the Human Parade. And uh, hi, Rosie. We are in New York City on the Upper West Side of Manhattan in the home of Renee Fleming, in the home of Rosie, the <laughs> King Charles Spaniel. And uh, Rosie is uh, adorable. And Renee Fleming is adorable. We'll stick adorable, with adorable, right? Totally. <laughs> and a soprano. And one of the most acclaimed and best singers we have. It's just true. It's just true. Nice to see you. Thank great to see you, Jay. I uh, was thinking about how to introduce you, and that was just a brief one. And I thought of calling you an opera singer. And I thought, you know, it's a little bit weird. We, we always call people who sing classical music opera singers, whether they sing songs or oratory or what have you. You are an opera singer, but you're a lot more than an opera singer. You are a singer-singer, a singer, an all-purpose singer. True? All-purpose singer. I like that. <laughs> Uh, a singer I, you for know, all seasons. Well, it, it's, labels are difficult anyway. And I, I find opera singer the easiest and, and quickest for people to understand what we do. Yeah. But um, classically trained works well. And also just generic singer. I mean, and every time I kind of land in a country, I always have this sort of, what am I going to write today? Am I going to say performer, entertainer, singer, you know, chanteuse? I mean, there are a million hmm. uh, labels, but my repertoire is so broad. And now I've sung also in multi-genre, so uh, opera singer is a little bit narrow. Yeah, right. You are just a singer, mm -hmm. and not just any singer. It's, um, what time is it? It's uh, about a little after 11.30 in the morning. And uh, I wonder, have you sung today? Have you tested oh. it out? Uh, what no. have you been doing? Oh, my goodness, no. Uh, that's the last thing I want to do on an off day. I mean, I really sing when I have to, and which happens to be most of the time. Yeah. So this whole week I'm off. So I will rehearse and, and sort of get Otello back up to speed and, um, and vocally and also in terms of memory. But outside of that, I never sing. Do you find yourself practicing quite a bit or does there come a time when you get to practice a little less, when things are ingrained and more automatic and you warm up a little less? Or is it always work, 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 due diligence, eat your vegetables? Well, it depends on the day. You know, this famous adage that there'll be seven fantastic singing days in a year and you, you won't be engaged on any of them. <laughs> um, it unfortunately turns out to be sort of true. So there are days when I hardly have to vocalize. First of all, my speaking voice is relatively low and I'm a soprano. So mm -hmm. it's, it takes a little bit of revving up to get up that octave and a half, two huh. octaves. So I have to vocalize quite a bit. I have colleagues who can literally walk on stage and open their mouths and sing. Mm -hmm. But I certainly can't. It takes a little bit of time. Do you ever sing for yourself for pleasure and here at home with no one around? Do you ever just bust out in, in song? Or um, do you need an audience? And I'm thinking that uh, I know some professional golfers. And the last thing they want to do is play a recreational round or a leisure round. No, they're pros. They play for money. Right. And they play to beat other people. Right. That's just their, their mindset. Yeah. And, you know, when it's game time and when there's money on the line, they play. Right. But I was thinking, you know, if I were Renee Fleming, that's a funny thought. Um, I, uh, <laughs> I would just, I'd want to sing all the time. I would just uh, get a kick out of it and say, wow, that's, that's pretty good. No, I don't. Uh, I, I'm saying I'm with the golfers, yeah. <laughs> I, I really, the last thing I want to do on an off uh, week is sing. Um, I'll listen to music. I never get tired of music. I never get tired of singers and experiencing singers and thinking about it. You know, I'm so passionate about it. But uh, frankly, I need a rest. Usually mm. when I have time off, my voice is really needs a rest. And uh, I, I mean, my schedule is so challenging when I am singing. Is a, a voice a matter of luck, kind of a biological lottery? I um. I know you know Marilyn Horn. I know you're a friend. And I think her father used to tell her, uh, now don't get too big for your britches, because what separates you from the rest of humanity is this little piece of gristle in your throat. <laughs> and she was born with an extraordinary instrument. Right. Born, I guess. Mm. And you were, too. Now, I imagine there are things you can do with it, cultivate it, develop it, train it. But is it kind of a, kind of a gift from above? I, my belief is that there are the best singers in the world are undiscovered. That there, I, can, I can hear somebody speaking voice when I'm walking down the street, when they walk past me, look at their physicality, look at their bone structure in their face and think, that's a great voice. 
Mm. You know, this person may not know it. They may never have even tried to sing, never have been discovered. Most of us have had a moment. I mean, obviously my background was entirely musical, but most people have a moment in high school usually where somebody says, you know, you have an instrument. You, you sound great. You're loud or you're or something that encourages them to explore the possibilities for the instrument. 90% of it is what you said before, the training, the languages, the style. The, we, there is no opera singer, classically trained singer, mm. who, who goes from that discovery, that aha moment of having a voice to the stage and without a tremendous amount of effort and work and, and knowledge. Are you, um and this is a slightly indiscreet question, but are you glad you're a soprano and not a mezzo or a contralto? <laughs> are, you, are you happy with the repertoire you have and the roles you have? Is it kind of a, it's a you know, it is good to be king, people say. It's good, <laughs> it's good to be a soprano, isn't it? You're, no, absolutely, I love being a soprano and I love being a lyric soprano because mm -hmm. I have the broadest scope of what I can do. I can go a little heavier, I can go lighter. Uh, my repertoire is huge, I've sung 51 roles. Mm. And two years from now, it'll be 53. And, you know, I'm not, who's counting? But mm. I love being a soprano. I get to be the heroine, uh, the people that, you know, the, the victim usually that the audience yeah. roots for. Yeah. The mezzo-soprano is very often the villain. And, uh, and certainly, you know, they used to say um, uh, the, they're playing witches very often to, and mothers and sometimes boys. And that can be challenging, too, because you can't do that forever. Mm -hmm. So I'm very happy where I am. Thank you. You remind me of something funny about um, uh, roles, uh, women who are victims, uh, tragic roles. Uh, Beverly Sills used to say something funny. Her, her husband didn't especially like opera, she said. He liked <laughs> symphonic music. And often he'd leave after the first or second act. So he thought that operas had a happy ending. <laughs> 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 the soprano usually gets it in the last act. Yes, it? yeah, that's true. Um, in fact, uh, one of my favorite phrases now when I give a concert is, you know, if I'm singing Rusalka, I'll say, this is The Little Mermaid. But because it's opera, everybody dies. Oh, right. <laughs> but then I did, I did Rodelinda, which does have a happy ending, which we're repeating this fall. And people... Mm -hmm were disappointed. By Handel, correct? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they were, they really just thought, I, I've come here to have a cathartic cry or, you know, to have this huge range of emotion. I don't really want a happy opera. Suits me fine. A happy <laughs> opera, I have to tell you. I like the comedy. I'm dying to play a comedic role. There are none for my voice type. So, yeah, let's think about that. What are the possibilities? Yeah, I mean, it, you know, earlier I could have done probably Elysia. There are a couple, um, usually yes, that, that, that's the elixir Rossini, of love. Rossini, Barber. I don't you. But yeah. I, I missed out on that repertoire, and so, you know, I've lost my opportunity for. No comedy. Rosine and the Barber Seville. No, no. The too many great lyric mezzos. That's a great role for yeah. a mezzo. Let's, um, let's talk about singers uh, a little bit. And uh, I just wonder. What singers of the past you've especially admired or, or learned from? I'm sure the list is long. Let's, let's make it abridged. I won't hold you to it as a complete <laughs> list. But um, give me a few who, who, have, who have meant something to you. Well, I listen copiously to singers, and, and, and I do it in a very repertoire-based way. So if I'm learning Strauss, there's a list of people I listen to. Mm -hmm. And if it's French, same. But, but by and large, the singers who I have um, thought to emulate um, are people who have had very broad repertoire. So Victoria de Angeles in the beginning, mm -hmm. um, Eleanor Stieber. You know, sometimes they're American singers too who have found their mark. Good West Virginian, Eleanor Stieber. Yes. Yeah. yeah, there's something about the water there, you know, Pennsylvania, that whole area. A lot of singing. Anna Moffo and Marilyn Horn, me, you know. Mm -hmm. And then. Um, uh, You're upstate New Yorker, correct? I grew mm -hmm. up in Rochester, mm -hmm. but I was born in Pennsylvania. Oh. So, Leanton Price. Absolutely. Um, and she also has mentored, she's been a mentor for me and uh, has been incredibly generous in sort of helping put my head on straight in p periods of stress uh, mm -hmm. and get the, the priorities right. Yeah. So uh, these are all singers that I really love. And then there are many others. I mean, they're really, I, 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 I can't, it's hard for me to pick a few. The Callis I always listen to. If I have something Italian to learn, I go right to her because her musicianship was just unparalleled. Smart cookie, wasn't she? Ooh. Yeah, and she always, there's something mature about whatever she sang, mature about the interpretation. She never gets kind of lost in the minutia. Mm -hmm. And um, A lot of people didn't like her voice. Uh, I wasn't one of them. 
I rather liked it. It was, you know, it wasn't off a shelf. It wasn't from a cookie cutter. It was different. Well, she and Schwarzkopf were both, I remember hearing them for the first time and not liking either one of them. Mm. Love them both now. You know, some singers who are an acquired taste yes. actually are more compelling in a way because it, 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 you've made some effort to kind of understand them and you love them a little bit more for that. It's not so kind of on the surface. Did you have master classes with Schwarzkopf? I did. I had a week with her. I yes, thought. Every day for a week. She not so sweet, I'm guessing? Well, she taught, I think, in the way that she learned, and I found it, uh, I found it, I, I, I gained enormous uh, skills from her. She gave me a few pieces of this large puzzle that were absolutely necessary for mm -hmm. my development. Uh, on the other hand, the process itself was kind of hard, yeah. <laughs> I would say. Yes, she was, yeah. uh, she was a taskmaster. Did you do anything with Fischer Diskow? As well. No, I met him once, um, you know, in a signing, <laughs> <Huh>. <laughs> and um, as a student. Uh, but I never, I never met him beyond that. C can you, um, kind of a funny question, can can you learn from men as a soprano? I mean, can oh, sure. can Caruso teach you something? Can, Absolutely. Doesn't have to be a, oh. another soprano or even another female singer. Um, I. First of all, I saw a series of recitals that uh, Fischer Disco gave at Carnegie Hall, again when I was a student, uh, of all of the sort of unknown repertoire of the major composers. Mm. And German art songs? Yeah, yeah, it was all leader. And uh, so I learned about programming. Um, he always sort of, sort of looked like a pigeon when he sang in the end. Huh. You know, it was a very high chess position. And I sort of started experimenting with that a little bit and found this. Um, a, a way of supporting that works really well for me. And then also, um, I'll never forget seeing a video, and it may have been on YouTube, I can't remember where I saw it, uh, ben, uh, Benjamino Gigli mm. singing Ombre Mai Fu mm. in Connecticut somewhere, in a <laughs> church. And I just thought, oh, that's, that's what it means to be simple. Yeah. And just sing the phrase with this p outpouring, this, this kind of truck of sound that a, and a I never forgot. Guy. Oh, it was so, so there have been singers from all, in all um, genders who've had huge, enormous influences on me. Pavarotti worshipped Gigli. Mm. Pavarotti is sometimes thought of as kind of a schlocky, clowny guy. <laughs> Great singer. I, I once heard you say he had, was it past tense at the time? At any rate, uh, he had perfect technique. Yes. Said. Oh, definitely. Perfect. Well, Absolutely. What? He is the textbook. But was it learned or was it just kind of an accident? I, was think it a gift he, I think he was a very natural singer, but you know, people say that about everyone. Who knows? Who knows? Somebody to be able to sing like that for that length of time and you don't kind of see, you, you just, it seemed natural to me, but I may be wrong. He may have really have studied, I don't know that much about his training, but the, a perfect technique, the perfect ah vowel, the perfect vowels, period. Interesting that when he went up to the high notes, he closed his mouth, so he really used the space, um, uh, and, and it was always beautiful and yeah. even. Yeah. And his diction was great. I mean, you know, you can't really... The ultimate Italian declamation. And he stood there, yeah. he just stood there and sang. I mean, and that's, frankly, that's all one needed. Planted his feet and sang. Yeah. Yeah. I don't go to a great many pop concerts. But uh, here in New York, um, James Taylor did a series at Carnegie Hall mm -hmm. recently. And I went to two of them, just to have something different to, to write about. He was marvelous. He has a real gift. And I wonder whether there are pop singers, and I use that in the broadest sense, you know, Ella Fitzgerald, Peggy right. Lee, uh, rockers. Uh, are there pop singers you especially like as, as singers, uh, naturals? I always thought that Kay Starr was a natural. She had marvelous intonation. Mm. Uh, I always thought Dolly Parton sang well. She does, and yes. And she's not a joke. No. She's, she's a damn good singer. Right, right. Who are some others? Well, and James Taylor, and I've had this conversation with him, one of the incredible things about him is he's still singing all his hits in the same keys he sang them in a long time ago. So oh. he's really maintained his register, which is unusual, uh, very unusual. Uh, I, I, there are lots and lots of singers. I mean, there are... Um, I really was a jazz fan and have, I'm still a jazz fan, so when you hear... A jazz singer, not just... Uh, yeah, no. I started in that world, but when you hear um, Sarah Vaughan, for instance, at a young mm. age, she could have been an operatic contralto. So mm. it was the most mellifluous, beautiful, rich sound. 
And there are a huge amount of singers that I really admire and listen to. My current favorite is Kurt Elling. He is a miracle. I, and when I heard him in concert not too long ago, I just went backstage and I said, Kurt, didn't anybody tell you you shouldn't be able to do that? You know, he has no limitations. You know, one of the things about our training is that we learn what to be afraid of. We mm -hmm. sort of, you, you pick that up, you absorb it from your colleagues and from teachers. But if nobody's ever told you, you shouldn't be able to hold out a high D for three minutes. So true. Then Isaac Stern once said he was listening to some little girl violin prodigy. And he said, she can do that because she has no idea how hard it is. Exactly. <laughs> That's it. That's it. Does it mean that I live under a rock? That I don't know the singer you're talking about. Kurt, ha, ha, Kurt is he's a passed me by. he's a jazz singer. He he's actually been in the White House quite a bit. He's a favorite of the Obamas. Huh. You need to listen to him. He's mm. he's extraordinary. Great musician also. Let's um, consider a couple of pop legends. Uh, was Elvis a good singer? I don't know. I never really listened very much to Elvis. I yes. liked his movies when I was little. Yeah. I loved his movies. Um, mm. So kind of charisma. Yeah, I, I think he was a package. He was a performer. Performer. I've never, um, I've never quite been on the Sinatra bandwagon myself, but everyone I know is. I didn't mm -hmm. care for the sound. You know, I love Tony Bennett and Perry Como and, um, the, you know, the sort of more beautiful sound. But with maturity and with sort of, um, you know, developing artistically, now when I hear Sinatra, I get, I get the phrasing. I get that now. I know, or at least I think I know, that you're a particular admirer of Joni Mitchell. Oh, I love Joni Mitchell. I grew, she was a touchstone for me when I was started in high school, and um, I still listen to her. What's good about her? What does she have? I don't know. I, you know, it's personal. I just mm. felt that she was singing my story. That you know, she spoke to me, and the combination of sort of prose and you know, when she was here's the thing: when she was young, she had a very high voice really high soprano, mm. and now it's a bass, practically. I don't even know if she sings anymore. Hmm. So, uh, and I wasn't that interested in her story. I've never been a person who follows people. I just like to listen yeah. to what they create. But um, I, I just like, I like the music, I like the songs. I was sitting with my 15-year-old doing homework last week, keeping her company, and she was playing Blue, Joni Mitchell, and oh. I thought, this has got to be. Un yes, so the two of uncoached. us are sitting there singing to this recording. And I thought, you know, in our generation, we, we didn't listen to what our parents listened to. Hmm. So, and I don't think she was particularly, I mean, she was sort of trying to say, Mom, I like this too, but hmm. it's nice. You know, my children have incredibly eclectic tastes in music. They've heard a lot, I'm sure. Yes, exposure. I once interviewed someone I'm sure you know, Ferruccio Furlanetto, the Italian bass. I asked, uh, what do you listen to at home? And he said he especially liked, I was really unprepared for this, he especially liked Paul Simon. Really? Yeah. And I said, um, well, tell me about that. I mean, great yeah, artist, yeah, great but, artist. But, I mean, I'm, but, but quite an I'm just surprised coming yeah, from Ferruccio. And uh, he said, he, he sings from the heart. He, he, he said, the key to singing is from the heart. And you can always tell sincerity and insincerity. Mm -hmm. And I thought about this. I um, I was in a setting not right. long ago, and there were some sort of semi-professional singers. Yeah. And someone asked me uh, afterward, "Well, how were they?" And you know, the, you, the right answer is, "Well, how were they to you? You know how <laughs> they were." But I, they were, let's say, um, un, unpolished. But they were so sincere. They mm. were so well-meaning, and they right. liked what they were doing. And that means so much, doesn't yes. it? Yes. Well, and there's this sort of you know constant push and pull between virtuosity and you know sort of expression. And it's that expression that with simplicity that's coming from your heart that can very often trump virtuosity. Yeah. And it's always, in our world, because what we do is by nature virtuosic. I mean, it's just, it's, it, it comes with the territory. Uh, we're unamplified, it's highly athletic, you know, from here to here. And, um, and it's extreme, extreme singing. Yeah. So, but if you don't have that sense of, of getting to the heart of what it is you're saying and communicating with the audience, then it really doesn't matter. Hmm. Um, I have one that's a little bit sociological for you. I don't really have the answer. But I, I sometimes hear, and I do have this impression, nothing scientific, hmm. that there's less singing in America, less community singing, less civic theater, maybe fewer church choirs and that there's simply less singing going on. 
Is that your impression? There's no question that the environment that I grew up in, which was choral heavy, um, mm. both in, my father was a choral conductor and uh, always in various churches when I was growing up, uh, there were fantastic music departments in my school district, uh, and I sang in not only one choir, but several choirs mm. all through high school. I had a tremendous training in public school. So I, I do believe that the fabric of that has changed. I had aunts and uncles who sang in various also um, groups where, a cappella groups, for instance, mm -hmm. barbershop quartets and all of that. So I, I do think that that has changed. There's a lot of other kind of singing though. I mean, my daughter and I watch American Idol uh, almost religiously now. Uh -huh. So there are, uh, there's a whole generation of children and young people who've grown up with that show. And that's another yes. kind of, interestingly enough, virtuosic singing. The mm. roulades, the, the kind of invention, it, it corresponds really well with bel canto and Handel singing and Baroque mm. singing. So I do think there's real interest in there out there, which, I, which heartens me, but it's not the kind of tradition that we grew up with. You, you go to Salt Lake City and work with the Mormon Tabernacle Choir, those people sing. Yeah. And they love singing. And they're normal people, right? They're yeah. hardware store owners and housewives. Absolutely. And Car and I'm sure they're, the choir. they're exact, and they're yeah. amateur, and those are my best fans because they've tried. They're trying to do it themselves. Yeah. You know, a hundred years ago, before all of this media existed, everyone was an amateur musician. Great composers could go to their friend's house, their doctor and their lawyer's mm -hmm. friends, and say, Try "I want to hear out. what this quartet sounds yeah. like. Will you sit down and play this?" Yeah, right. So times have really changed. Did you guys sing at home around a piano as you were growing up? Yes, and my parents also sang, and they practiced, and there were memorable nights when the whole neighborhood would come around the front door in a summer night and listen. Yeah. And um, So it was a really heady environment in terms of just music and loving music. Well, here's something new under the sun, or newish, and that is YouTube. And uh, I know it's double-edged. I think it's a... I'm addicted. Me too. <laughs> it's a bonanza for the consumer. Oh, it's a for bonanza, us. and it's... But I heard you say once that um, it's a little bit tricky because you sing somewhere, not me, you sing somewhere, and it may wind up on YouTube, and there's a little less, I think I remember you were saying, there's a little less going out somewhere and trying out something, trying out some new music and getting it right and then singing it elsewhere. Right. It might show up on YouTube. But overall, it's a, it's a, it's a positive thing, right? It's a, it's a windfall. Yeah, I, I do think that, that that has taken away that opportunity for us who are sort of... Um, in the limelight to go to an off the beaten track place and try something out. There's no question that no longer exists. It's not possible. Mm. Uh, however, it is a bonanza, as you said, for, for just discovery. And, f and you can sit there for hours just following the trail of some obscure, wonderful performance. Mm. And all of the historic um, recordings now have been posted. And it can be quite fascinating. You can also see a tremendous amount of live performances. Yeah. I have to say yeah. this. I do suspect that there's a, a surprisingly large percentage of operas which are cast around the world now off of YouTube mm -hmm. where people, you know, you don't have the time to hear somebody sing or have them audition or have them travel. And it's very easy to just go click and say, oh, that's that. Oh, okay. Now I get, I get that performance. Can you tell generally? You can, can tell a, a lot. Tell, mm. You can tell a lot. You cannot tell the volume of a person's voice. You cannot tell the real live quality. Some people's voices come alive in an acoustic in a way that they never will on the microphone. Do YouTube and similar things mean that people are buying fewer records? I still call them records, whatever they are now. Uh, is, it, is, is it bad for business? In a way? Ter yes, it's terrible for the recording industry. Um, they're, they're, it's had a, an enormous uh, influence. I mean, I'm also an iTunes enthusiast, so it's quick, it's immediate. When I'm traveling around the world, I don't have to wait for a CD to arrive. And sometimes I do both. I'll, you know, I'll buy a CD and also um, download the, the same tracks because I want the, also the booklet. And mm -hmm. so, yeah, it, it is, there's no question that that's been a real issue. And they haven't figured out, they haven't found a business model yet, which will enable them to continue, them meaning r recording studios, to continue making quality recordings um, in, in a financially viable way, while the audience will still want this immediacy of kind of instant music. Kind of a funny question for you. I was thinking about this earlier. I once wrote that I thought that there was a bit of a bias against beautiful voices on the part of critics. 
uh, that sometimes critics were a little bit snotty about a beautiful voice as merely beautiful. But I, I've sensed a certain, among music critic colleagues, bias against beautiful voices. You have just about the most beautiful voice in creation. Do you know what I'm talking about? Or is that, or is that foreign to you? I do. I'm thinking about it as you're saying that. It's an interesting concept. I do think that there is, uh, people are particularly hard on the reigning diva, you know, or group of, group of mm -hmm. DB and sopranos. And the thing with me, and I've had this criticism a lot too, and the problem is, you know, uh, if you're singing in the passaggio and above, first of all, the ability, a soprano's ability to be... I'm so sorry. Tell us what a passaggio is. Okay, this passaggio, mm. it means break. Mm. And, you know, there are several breaks in the voice, but the one for the soprano that's particularly challenging is uh, just at the top of the staff. So around E and F, you know, E flat to F sharp, say. And to be able to maneuver through that part of the voice requires so much skill and care, otherwise you never get beyond it up into the high re register, number one. So that, that's something that really takes an enormous amount of attention. And Curie um, sang mostly Mozart and Strauss repertoire, which lives in that part of the voice. Mm -hmm. Secondly, we can't be understood up there. Mm -hmm. It's almost impossible. I always say, try to say a sentence while you're yawning. That uh -huh. is the soprano's life. Yeah. And it's not the same for a tenor because um, men typically in a high register can, are actually more comfortable if they're pronouncing clear vowels. Mm -hmm. uh, but for us, it's almost impossible. I do my best. I really try hard. I think the words are add color. They're important. And I've worked very hard to, to try and bring diction to even the highest range. So those are the challenges, and those are sometimes open us up to a little bit of a different criticism. There's also, because there's so much pressure to be glamorous today, mm. that people see that as a kind of a shallow pursuit. Yeah. She must not be serious about her art. Um, so there are a lot of kind of complex issues there mm. when you raise that question. There have been some beautiful opera singers, always. I often cite Geraldine Farrar from the 19 Ox oh, and yes. Teens, who was so beautiful that she appeared in silent movies <laughs> where her singing didn't do her any good. <laughs> and you've, you've had slim, pretty types like Roberta Peters. And, you know. But uh, there, there's a, an image of the opera singer as, as fat, uh, especially the, the female opera singer. The opera ain't over till the fat lady sings. Right. You, you, Warner Brother cartoons have a, you know, a, a big mama, a big Teutonic mama with, with horns. Right. And there's this uh, impression, and I've often argued, you know, opera singers are no plumper than the population at large, no pun intended. Um, maybe they're less plump, but still people think, you know, singers, they're, they're girthy folk. Yeah. Um, I can ask you because you're so glamorous. Uh, is, it, is it true? Are opera singers heftier than average people, or is it just, just an image? I think there's some truth to the to it in, in a couple of ways. One is we do not tend to be very small people. To have a voice that can project over an orchestra, a chorus, and into the back of a house that seats 4,000, they're mostly big people. I mean, yeah, I just say Yeah, people don't quite cut it. I, there, are, there have been few exceptions, yeah. and, and, and they're not always, the women aren't always tall. I mean, I was shocked when I met Birgit Nielsen. She was not a tall woman at all. Huh. Um, but they, t but the men I just sang with in Capriccio, for instance, were all uh, well above six feet. Mm -hmm. So this is becoming more and more the case. Uh, do we need to be overweight to sing well? No, mm -hmm. definitely not. When people, however, have been overweight and had a tremendous careers and then lost weight quickly, it's changed their body. Marie Callas is the most famous example of that, for instance. So it's changed their technique and their body. And if they're at the top of kind of the pressured part of the career and without time to really adjust, that can create a lot of technical problems. And I've seen that happen a couple of times. Hmm. Um, on the other hand, singers do represent society at large. And I have seen a lot of young singers who are gonna struggle with that because there's so much competition now that the opera world is saying, sorry people, we want you to look like our favorite movie stars and television mm -hmm. stars, so, and act and roll around the floor and wear a negligee while you're doing it. So this is the pressure. Mm -hmm. I, thank God, well, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not <laughs> just starting out because that's what young people are facing now. 
But um, I suppose all things being equal, uh, the pretty gal would get the nod, but all things are seldom equal. That's right. I mean, Montserrat Caballé could sing, um, not, a, not a svelte woman, right. uh, Birgit Nilsson, and, and so on. Uh, there's got to be room for such people. Uh, oh, am I right? in a major voice, of, in, a, in a sort of world-class instrument, particularly in, in Verdi, Puccini, and Wagner, absolutely. That should yeah. trump everything else. Right? I think, well, yeah. for me it does trump everything else. If somebody sings so beautifully that, they, that I'm touched, mm. I, could, I, could, I really don't care what they look like at all. You know? so I, I, and I think for people to lose sight of the fact that this is a sung art form with a tradition that is, that is sort of hyper-human in a way, uh, and if they try to reduce it literally to the acting in the theater, then a lot will be lost. Mm -hmm. You know, go to the theater. Mm -hmm. right. Go to the theater. I mean, it, yeah. opera is sung. Yeah, lyric theater. Emphasis on lyric. Yes. Yeah. Try this on for size. Uh, I have a soprano friend who sings in oratorios and so on, and, and she'll show up for the first rehearsal, and she's never met the other singers. Mm -hmm. And there are three others, and obviously the other woman is the mezzo. <laughs> and she, she, she profiles a little bit. She says, almost invariably, a, a fat fellow is the tenor, and a skinny little guy is the bass. And she said over her career, she's just noticed this. Yeah. There's skinny little basses, aren't there, with big, booming voices. That's a funny phenomenon. Yeah, um, I don't know. Yeah, I don't, uh, I, I haven't ascribed body types to voices no. so much. Mm. No, I haven't seen that so consistently. I, I've more recently, I mean, seen a lot of quite tall bases. Oh. I mean, it really has something to do with the, your actual you know, larynx and how it's shaped. And I mean, I don't know enough about that. It's interesting, since I learned how to sing, uh, there's now a whole physiological understanding of singing that didn't exist when I started out. So um, it's been fascinating for me to learn that from my sister who's just completing her doctorate in vocal pedagogy. So I'm sure that somebody who's knowledgeable could sit there and tell you exactly why. You know, why, does a ba why is a bass a bass? What's different about his larynx? Um, but that they're thin or not, I, don't, I haven't really picked up on that. Let's talk about uh, Mozart and Mozart singing. Uh, you're a famous Mozartian. Um, I was. I was. I, you, you are. And um, I, I thought of something the, the pianist Arthur Rubinstein said. Mm -hmm. uh, this is about uh, Mozart for the piano. That it's, um, it's too easy for children and too hard for adults. Uh, Mozart requires purity, common right. sense, right. a rarefied sense. Mm -hmm. Is there something special about singing Mozart? And I wonder why, in my opinion, you may disagree, so few people do it really well. Well, for me, Mozart was the greatest uh, taskmaster, and I'm so fortunate that I began my career singing 10 years of Mozart, because I also credit Mozart as one of my um, most demanding voice teachers, because the music requires uh, a, a, a degree of perfection, clarity, purity, perfect style, perfect language. It's exposed because the orchestra is not drowning you out half the time, which can be sometimes a good thing. Uh, and, um, I, and then the characters are also so richly drawn. But I found it, I, when I stopped singing Mozart 10 years ago, it was with a tremendous sense of relief. You know, it was so hard. And partly because the repertoire that I sang was uncomfortable, you know, sat in a very uncomfortable place. A lot of the repertoire that we find challenging today was not written that way because in the day in which it was written, orchestras weren't as brilliant, pitch was considerably lower. Mm. So something that just sits a little bit too high would have been fine mm -hmm. then. And I also really believe that people didn't sing the same way then they do now. We now are filling huge halls singing in a much more athletic, big, um, large-voiced, um, chest uh, kind of production. And I, th I believe that people in, uh, even 100 years ago, sang with more head voice, much lighter. What's head voice, Renee? Head voice is a sort of a hooty sound. It's about resonance. It's mm -hmm. th that your resonance would be very high as opposed to chest voice, which is kind of, you know, if I were to, to speak on pitch right now, it would be in a much lower uh, quality. Um, and we, when we talk about resonance, we really talk about placement and, and where it is literally in your body. We mentioned Marilyn Horn before, 
and uh, who has a heck of a chest voice in addition to... Oh, yes. Uh, she once said that she, she thought of making an album of favorites called Chestnuts for Chestnuts. <laughs> That's <laughs> one, wonderful. One of, one of her lines. But oh, she's so brilliantly down to earth. I love her. Yeah. That's great. Absolutely. For chest nuts. Yeah. Hmm. Um, you, talking about Mozart, you use the word exposed. And I just wonder whether, uh, in your view, um, singers are more exposed, more vulnerable than other musicians. I mean, a, a piano has this, pianist has this kind of instrument, uh, a saxophonist has his, the medium of the saxophone. But the singer is himself or, or herself. Is it more of a, would you say, a high wire act than being another kind of musician? Uh, I think there's something to that. I mean, we don't, there's no instrument between us and the audience. There's no physical, there's nothing to hold on to, for mm -hmm. one thing. I mean, someone with a microphone, you could say that they have that little bit of protection there. But we're on stage singing acoustically uh, with nothing but our bodies and hearts uh, to guide us. and. We're also looking at the audience, whereas m many instrumentalists are involved. Oh, I never thought of that, actually. Yeah. yeah. Conductors never see no. the audience. No. So we're, I can take in, I know who's sleeping, I know who's looking at their watch. Um, it must I know be who's. Annoying. Well, it's distracting sometimes, yeah. you know. So uh, it, it does make it a little bit harder. And the tendency, interestingly enough, physically when you're singing and when you're learning, is to close off is to somehow with your body protect yourself. And it takes courage and experience to really open up. You're not really a counselor. And you remember the famous line, um, Miss Caballé will be available for a limited number of cancellations next season? <laughs> you are not a counselor. No. Uh, you're, you're kind of a gamer. And if it says 8 o'clock, you, you show up at 8 o'clock and you open your mouth and you do your best. But um, there must be days when it's, when it's not quite there. When do you know? When do you cancel? How late? Last minute? Do you know in the morning? Do you figure you'll you know, suck it up for the evening? It must be tricky. Pianists, you know, once in a blue moon, might have that problem uh, if they're ill, but otherwise they just go they, you know, and right. blow their nose between pieces of things. Right, right. It's funny, one of my uh, one respected impresario said to me not long ago, do you want to know what your reputation is in the business? And I said, uh -oh. I'm not sure, uh, but go ahead, tell me. And he said, well, your reputation is that you're impossible to get, but once you have committed to something, you are there. Mm -hmm. I said, that's not so bad, really. You yeah. know, I'm not impossible to get because I'm being rare. It's because I sing, I have no reduced territory. I sing all over the world, and I'm a parent. You know, it's just, uh, mm -hmm. I can't be everywhere. But the cancellation issue is an interesting one. First of all, if, if you make it in this business, you're well. By and large, you know how to keep yourself healthy. Or you just yeah. simply, it, you just can't sustain. You know, people will only put up with so many cancellations, mm -hmm. unless you're really, really special. Mm -hmm. Teresa Stratus comes to mind. Just, just about to say She could get yeah. away with it, yeah. Um, so that's Frankly, one I thing. I thought it added to her mystique. I mean, this is a personal opinion. Yeah, and yeah. I always thought that, you know, she, she got a little bit more applause than she would have otherwise. People were so happy to see her. Yeah. She didn't cancel. <laughs> if she just showed up, and right? Yeah, yeah. I also thought she said to me that she, yeah. she was fragile. She said, uh, my health has always been fragile. Huh. You know, she was a great yeah. artist, so it, it was worth it. Um, but I, I, I found that, first of all, most of my colleagues rarely cancel. And secondly, when I have canceled, it's really a hard decision. I am conscientious, so I, really, mm -hmm. I do not want to disappoint the audience. And the worst cancellation was opening night of Peter Grimes. This is in the mid-'90s at mm -hmm. the Met. And I was a little bit indecisive. Um, I felt that something was coming on that was, had, was really in my throat. I mean, I had cold you can really sing through. <laughs> and uh, one of the administrators was saying, please go on, please go on. You know, that, that's his job, mm -hmm. to say, we need you to go on. It's opening night. There's mm -hmm. an expectation here. And someone in the music staff was standing behind him, and I was trying to sing and was saying, you know, could hear the... Because the danger is that if you make a misstep, you, you can have an injury yeah. that ends your career or that puts you out of commission for a long time. Think of the longer term, not just the night. That's right. Yeah. So I did cancel, and, um, but I've canceled very little. You mentioned um, singing all over the world. <laughs> Knock, I'm superstitious, <laughs> knocking. No, you're, uh, you're, 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 you're a gamer, <laughs> not a canceler. Um, you mentioned singing all over the world, and I just wonder where the best audiences are. 
quietest, most attentive, most appreciative. Uh, they go nuts in Japan, I imagine. British audiences used to be known as very, very polite, giving you hearty applause, but then being, um, being very quiet during a performance. Where, uh, who's a good audience? By nationality. Do you know, I'm asked this question sometimes, and I used to try and answer it, and I finally decided. I don't mean to bore you with these repeated questions. No, no, <laughs> it's an interesting question because mm -hmm. there, you can, there are nationalistic characteristics to audiences. You can kind of say, you know, based usually in Western Europe on the fact that people have grown up with this music, they're sophisticated, they're knowledgeable, mm -hmm. and they have high expectations. You mm -hmm. know, and there are some audiences too that, by nature tend to cross their, fold their arms and say, well, show us, you know. Um, American mm -hmm. audiences can be just consistently generous. Y they mm -hmm. don't have that sort of, sh and ever, that show us kind of attitude. But some major cities, New York for one, this extremely cultivated audience with high expectations. But what I'm getting to is that even in a city where you think you know what the audience is like, every single performance, say, in a run of an opera run will be different. So I don't understand that chem whatever chemical interaction occurs between the performance and the audience is different every night. You never know night to night. No, I, I and it seems that. to yeah. occur. It's a community experience, and, and the audience, they do it themselves somehow. There's nothing like live. You know, I, no. I appreciate a studio recording. I'm glad we have them. We all have yes. thousands of them, although they're not being made so much now. Right. But there's really nothing like live warts and all. I was just in Berlin uh, with the Berlin Philharmonic, which is always a special joy, mm -hmm. and Christian Thielemann, and what, he, what they were able to do dynamically with one of the songs I sang was on such an extreme level, both the highs and the lows and the softs and the louds, mm -hmm. and no microphone could ever capture that. Mm -hmm. It would flatten it out. So you, you get a thrill just hearing that range. I, I have a... a attended a couple of voice recitals in recent weeks, I guess in the last month, both, as it happens, accompanied by your friend Kevin Murphy. And one was his wife, Heidi Grant Murphy, mm -hmm. the soprano. Wonderful. And uh, one was the mezzo-soprano, Michelle DeYoung. And uh, each one concluded her recital with a set of spirituals. Uh, each one is white. And I remember years ago, George London, the bass, made a whole album of spirituals. Right. Uh, these songs, if I can call them that, mm -hmm. they really belong to everyone, right? To all Americans and all people, really. And I, you know, these singers, they say, I just don't want to pass them up. They're part of our DNA. I want to sing right. them. Um, people of all races, I think, should sing these spirituals. Uh, what do you think? That's a, that's a very good question. Uh, in my, the duration of my career, uh, for me, it's been something that I wouldn't attempt to do. The, that it was definitely not something. When I was trained, you did not jump into that territory. It didn't belong to you. Um, Porgy and Bess was an issue. I used to sing Porgy and Bess, and I still sing Summertime constantly mm -hmm. in concert. Um, and even that was sometimes frowned upon. So it, it's, you know, it's sort of a, a situation where, of course, a, a fantastic African-American singers are saying, leave us our music. You know, let us mm -hmm. sing what we're really authentically, what we have have in our blood and in our training and our you know early learning and um, uh, and that by and large has been the case. However, you know it doesn't apply to Otello. It doesn't apply to Aida. It doesn't apply to any number of operas, for instance, which have you know nationalistic themes and singers and you, you know but we can't cast them half the time. Mm. And it's a very tough question. It's a very interesting question. You, you sing so soulfully. You know, but I believe you I believe everything should be cast blind. I, I yeah. think, as, as a rule of thumb, we should be able to cast anybody in a role if they're right for the role. The audience already suspends disbelief when they see me playing a sixteen-year-old. Yeah. When first of all, when they see us singing, you know, we're enacting real life and we're singing to each other. So that's an enormous yeah, leap. Yeah. So to suddenly adjust to people being family members from different races is just a tiny leap. Mm. I wonder if your, um, if your musical tastes have changed over the years. Do you find that you're closer to certain music than you once were? Certain music means more to you. Do you? I know Richard Strauss has been a very good friend of yours. You've been a very good friend of his and his music. Right. 
But um, do, you, do you find your tastes evolving, or are they pretty much constant? I'm something I've picked up on, I don't know if it's true or not, but when you're young, you want to do everything that's hard and fast and loud and, um, and broke, say, you know, mm -hmm. colorful and passionate. And a little splashy, maybe. Splashy. And then, you know, I would meet these phenomenal conductors and musicians who would be interested in Schumann. And I think, well, what, what do they like? Why do they like Schumann? Mm -hmm. There's nothing going on, really. So that's a young person's taste. And it takes maturity, I do think, to kind of understand the simpler expression, the simpler statement. You know, there's certain pianists and other musicians who begin their day by going to the piano and playing something the well tempered clavier of, of Bach. Right. It's, um, it's almost a, a time of communion. It's a spiritual moment. Um, do you have that with music, if only in your head, even if you don't sing? Is, is there some music that is, um, works as a kind of prayer or meditation? No. Does it depend on what you've been doing lately? It's what I've been doing lately. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm very, I'm always preparing new things. What's, what interests me is that if I'm singing an opera, when I go home, the music that I wake up to and the music that I can't get out of my head that plays in a loop is never mine. It's never what I sing. It's always what my colleagues sing. So I don't, I don't understand. I mean, it's because I've been listening to them, I suppose, but uh, interesting. In every generation, there are people who say that classical music is dying. We won't have it anymore. This is it, the end of the line. In fact, Charles Rosen, the pianist and scholar, once quipped that the death of classical music is its oldest tradition. Uh, I talked to... Uh, gloom and doomers, and, and they make a certain case. They're not just, you know, Cassandras. Right, right, right. And I talk to people who say, nonsense, music will be just fine. Uh, Lauren Mazel, told, the conductor, told me, uh, think about China. Think about that, Mark. They're mad for music. Are you, um, are you feeling gloomy about the classical art, or do you think it's healthy and robust and audiences are there? Well, this is an issue that is taking a tremendous amount of my attention now because I'm the new creative consultant for Lyric Opera of Chicago. Mm -hmm. And what interests me about uh, Lyric Opera in Chicago is this whole issue of outreach and where is the next audience and education and marketing and, you know, how, how do we get people back into the house now, as we earlier said, that this tradition of singing is not so much, we can't take that for granted anymore. Mm -hmm. How do we get them interested? And... Um, there's no question, I don't, first of all, classical music is never going to disappear. That, that's, that's not going to happen. What is classical music, though? A hundred years after Mahler was in Vienna, exactly a hundred years, mm. uh, we're still playing the same tunes. Mm -hmm. We're still listening. You know, he wrote, in Vienna, I, am, I have established Beethoven, Mozart, and Wagner. I'm doing something really exciting and fresh. Mm. And when I saw that, um, when I was at this exhibit a year ago, I thought, things haven't changed that much. A lot of what's been written in the 20th century has not taken hold and become part of the standard, at least operatic fare. And I love 20th century classical music, most of it. Mm -hmm. uh, I really, that's my ear gravitates in that direction. So how do we redefine classical music in the future? How do we change perhaps the boundaries of classical music so that it's more inclusive? To the audience, or when we talk about classical music, are we now talking about a museum historic art form? Mm. Are we talking about music from the late 19th and early 20th century, by and large, and before? Yeah. Those are the issues that I think are so fascinating, uh, and we want, ideally, we want a large audience because without that, it's a almost unsustainably uh, unsustainable art form given the expense of it, opera in particular. Mm -hmm. And you want qualified players and singers. You want people who are great. But the, the new media are helpful, aren't they? The live streaming and YouTube. They are, but they're also... But people don't pay. Well, no, the, the, new, the, the HD broadcasts from the Met, I think, are fantastic. They're very high quality. So, but it, are they putting other people out of work? Are, are people going to say, you know, for $20, I can go and see the best opera that mm -hmm. exists in the world. Why would I pay $100 to go uh, to my local company? And I, I think that that is still a little bit in flux right now. We're trying to figure that out. Mm. You know, it's a very expensive art form. Here's kind of a pesky question. Um, pianists and conductors and violinists to a degree can go on and on. And singers are more like athletes. 
Um, is there, it's unfair, isn't it? Yes, it yeah. yes, we, we're short, yes. We're uh, the sort of 20 year career and um, a great conductor, great pianist, they will, they can die on stage, mm -hmm. you know. And, so it is hard. I mean, one of the funny things I've noticed is that voice teachers tend to live for a long time. Mm -hmm. There's something about always maintaining a kind of involvement in music that keeps you young. First of all, you have students who are young, so that, yeah. that keeps you young. But singers, yeah, it's very, uh, uh, it, it is short, you know. I suddenly woke up this year and thought, oh my gosh, I'm in the home stretch. Mm -hmm. Hmm. It, it's shocking because we all feel quite young now. You mm -hmm. know, we're, mm -hmm. we're much younger than our parents and our grandparents were at our age. Mm -hmm. So we feel physically good. We have energy. We have a positive outlook. We are maintaining our looks and our sense of youth. But this is a muscle and, you know, and a sort of cartilage and it's subject to the to the t to time, what it does to your joints and what it does to the rest of your body, it does here. So can you be wise and change your repertoire so that you can sing for a long time and still give people enormous pleasure? Because when I stop singing, no one will ever in the history, future or past, hear my voice again. And that's why singers are have their own special interest. It's because each instrument is unique. Mm -hmm. And we're lucky to have recordings and you live in the era of recordings, which was from, what, about 1902 on, something right, like that? Right, right. I don't think we know what Patti sounded like. Yes. Uh, Malibran and so on. But um, recordings, they're kind of souvenirs, aren't that's they? That's right, that's right. Uh, they're not quite the same, but they're better than nothing for sure. Right. That's a legacy issue for us uh, mm -hmm. because you want to leave something. You want people to remember how you sounded or how you looked. It's, just, it's not the real thing, but it, it's nice to have something. Well, have you sung your song? There's a, there's a song, When I've Sung My Songs. <laughs> right. Right. Um, have you sung your songs? You still have stuff left to do. Uh, obviously, you have tons left to do in, in life, broadly speaking. Right. But I'm really talking about particular music that you'd like to right. sing or record. Or do you think that the uh, legacy is established? Well, back to being a lyric soprano, it's endless what I can sing. Endless. Mm -hmm. I could learn now another 50 obscure roles if I wanted to. I have two coming up in the next few years. But more than that, and what really is interesting me now is uh, song literature, uh, is programming, mm -hmm. making programs that are interesting, that are thematic, that are that uh, an unearthing music that fortunately I've always had a healthy musical curiosity and a lot of yeah. what I've recorded has been repertoire that people aren't Off familiar beat. with. Yeah. yeah, so I can continue to do that um, as long as it interests me. So yeah, no, I, I don't, not, I haven't yet sung my songs. Can you, can you pull an Eileen Farrell and have a jazz cabaret career? Which you had anyway earlier well, on. Well, I'll tell you not, who not, it's, not so appealing? Well, no, who inspires me is Barbara Cook. She really, really inspires me. She's my neighbor. Hmm. She's a phenomenal, she's an amazing person. And when she gets up and talks about her art form and the songs and what they mean to her, it's such a wonderful experience. Uh, so that, that sort of interests me, that idea. I'd like to, to end on food. Um, oh, my favorite. Yeah, well, <laughs> mine too. Um, Nellie Melba was an Australian soprano of long ago. The... Uh, 1890s and 19 aughts, and, and Escoffier invented for her Melba toast, right? And peach Melba. <laughs> right. So she has a dessert forevermore. Yes. You really hit the big time because you have a dessert. Right. I have not had it yet. I'd like to. I'm not sure where to order it, but it's called La Diva Renee. Right. 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 It's chocolatey, as I understand. Where, where do you get it? Well, it's at Danielle. Uh, and I, you might be able to call in, and, and I don't think it's currently on the menu, you might be able to call in and request it, but Danielle and I uh, cooked this up on a New Year's Eve some years ago. We were celebrating together, and, and I mentioned the Melba desserts, yeah. and you know, we have Pavlova's has something, we have chicken tetrazzini. Check, yeah. yeah, chicken tetrazzini. Yeah. So this is, there are, and I'm sure there are many, many other dishes, mm. um, perhaps more local. But uh, he said, yes, let's do something. And they, he asked me, what do you like? And I said, well, chocolate goes without saying. 
Uh, and then it's a champagne cream, and there's a little bit of you know fruit involved. Um, but the funniest thing of all is that initially my face was laser printed on the top of this kind of Napoleon style dessert. Fantastic. Fun. Um, I have an iris. I have a fragrance. These are interesting excuse things. Me, an iris? Yes, it's a Renee Fleming uh, a iris. Flower? Yes, a beautiful iris. Fabulous. So and a fragrance. Mm -hmm. I remember seeing the Beverly Sills. She has something too. Maybe also an iris. Leanton Price, I think, has a rose, and I just thought, I want a flower. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Ambition for uh, naming. Yeah, it's interesting. Are you going to host a TV show? Because you oh, should. I don't. I don't. Beverly, guess. the Beverly substituted for Johnny, right? It, boy, was show. that a good time, wasn't yeah. it? Wasn't that a good time when when act, when classical musicians were seen regularly on mainstream television? Yeah. It's a shame that that has gone by the wayside. Well, if we're not going to ask Renee Fleming, we're not going to ask anyone. Oh, thank you. I'm so happy to see you. I've loved this hour. Went by like a shot. Thank you so much. And thank you all for watching this edition of The Human Parade. We'll be back with another one, an interesting guest or guests. They'll have their own talents. They won't sing as well as Renee Fleming, but uh, we'll do our best. Thank you so much. Do you sing along when you're listening to recordings? Do you know, do you know if you're listening to an opera you really like, do you know the words? and? I know some operas pretty well. Mm -hmm. The thing is, I know music What's better favorite? than words. Ah. Uh. I don't know. I, I could do a little less. Right, 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 right. I like Julius Caesar. Yes. Oh. It's like I call the it five-hour version. One continual highlights reel. Really.